Hello everyone and welcome to Quick Med, where medicine is explained quickly and easily. Today we'll be talking about direct and indirect Coombs test, so let's get to it. The Coombs test is also known as the anti-globulin test, specifically the anti-human globulin, which is an antibody directed against human antibodies. Whether you're talking about the direct or the indirect Coombs test, the key principle behind both is this. Anti-human globulin will bind to proteins attached to human red blood cells and cause visible agglutination. If that doesn't make a lot of sense yet, just bear with me, we'll be going over this principle in detail. First, we need to address what agglutination is. Agglutination is when you use this anti-globulin reagent that binds to antibodies on the red blood cell and acts as a bridge, causing cells to clump, which you can visibly see in the test tube. As you can see in this diagram, here we have a group of red blood cells that have antibodies attached because some sort of hemolytic reaction has already taken place. But in the test tube, we don't see any signs of agglutination or clumping of the cells together. It's only when we add our reagent, which involves the anti-human globulin that we discussed, that we can see clumping. And this is because those antibodies are a little bit larger and so they can sort of grab the antibodies attached to the red blood cells more than one antibody attached to the red blood cell, in fact, and cause clumping to occur, which we can see in the test tube here. So let's start with a direct Coombs test, which is basically detecting antibodies already bound to the RBC. So this is something that already happens within the living organism or in vivo. So because of this, I want you to think of the direct Coombs test as a diagnostic test, because the event has already happened and we're pretty much just trying to diagnose the disease. If you're wondering what types of diseases I'm talking about, it's going to involve some type of immune-mediated hemolytic anemia, and this can involve different types. You have your autoimmune hemolysis, which is when our own antibodies attack you know, self-antigens, and this includes the warm and cold hemolytic diseases. You have your drug-induced hemolysis, which can occur as a result of a variety of different medications. And then there's also your alloimmune hemolysis, which involves hemolytic disease of the newborn, which I already made a video about, so feel free to check that out if you're not too familiar with this concept, as well as hemolytic transfusion reactions, which are reactions that occur after receiving a blood transfusion. So how is a direct Coombs test performed? It's actually quite simple. Here we're suspecting that this patient already has had a hemolytic reaction that took place, and so we need to get a blood sample from the patient. The patient's RBCs are removed and washed in order to get rid of any antibodies that are not attached to the RBC surface. We then add the anti-human globulin reagent, which, as we said, will involve antibodies that have you know, multiple binding sites for these antibodies bound to the red blood cell surfaces. And this will cause visible agglutination, which you can see in the test tube, and that would be a positive result. This would indicate that the patient has had some sort of hemolytic reaction that took place. Let's now contrast this with the indirect Coombs test, which is detecting antibodies in the serum rather than antibodies that are already bound to the RBC surface, as we said with the direct Coombs test. The indirect Coombs test is usually done as a screening procedure in order to find antibodies that have the potential to cause a hemolytic reaction. So this is a test that we do before anything even takes place in order to hopefully prevent something from happening. So I want you to think of this test as more of a preventative test rather than a diagnostic one. What are indications for performing an indirect Coombs test? This could involve pre-blood transfusion testing in order to make sure that the donor and recipient are compatible and that we're limiting the risk of having any hemolytic reactions from occurring. As you probably know, the donor and the recipient must be ABO and RHD compatible, and these are two major antigens that exist on the surface of red blood cells. This often involves the type and screen, which you've probably heard of, the type is actually making sure that the patient and the donor are going to be ABO and RHD compatible, but the screen is done in order to check for any possible antibodies that could cause trouble. This screening process that's done, or this antibody screen, is actually the indirect Coombs test. So you'll often hear these two used interchangeably. And this screen is checking for non-ABO antibodies that potentially exist in the patient's serum or the recipient's serum that could possibly cause issues if they receive a blood transfusion. This is because there are major antigens that exist on the red blood cell surface, like the ABO and RHD antigens, but there are also some minor antigens that can cause some issues as well. We also use the indirect Coombs test for maternal antibody screening, and this is commonly done with every pregnancy. Here, we're screening for any IgG antibodies that possibly exist in mom's blood that could cross the placenta and affect babies' RBCs, leading to hemolytic disease of the newborn.
So how was the indirect Coombs test performed? It's a little bit different from the direct Coombs test because as we said, we're trying to screen for antibodies that exist in the patient's serum that could potentially cause a hemolytic reaction. So in this case, we actually need the patient's serum or plasma and mix this with red blood cells from a group O blood donor in order to prevent any sort of ABO incompatibility issues that has a known RBC antigen profile. These two are then incubated together and the cells are washed to remove any unbound antibodies. Here, when you incubate the two, you're trying to induce a hemolytic reaction. Anti-human globulin reagent is then added, just like it was before, in order to detect if there were any antibodies that ended up binding to the RBC surface. If you see any agglutination in the test tube, this would be a positive result, indicating that this patient has antibodies in their serum that could potentially lead to a hemolytic reaction. An example of this would be a pregnant mother screening positive on her antibody maternal screen, which would indicate that she has IgG antibodies that could potentially cross the placenta and affect her baby, that is if baby is RH positive. This would alert the physician that there is an increased risk of hemolytic disease of the newborn taking place and that the clinician needs to monitor mom and baby a little bit more closely. All right, before we run through this practice question, let's just summarize what we already discussed. I want you to think of a direct Coombs test as a diagnostic test because we're trying to determine if a hemolytic reaction already took place. And so the first step of this process is to collect a patient's blood sample because we need to test whether or not their antibody is bound to their RBCs. On the other hand, the indirect Coombs test is more of a preventative test because no hemolytic reaction has taken place, but we're screening for the potential that it could. And so the first step of this test is to collect the patient's serum to detect for any antibodies that could cause trouble down the line. If you can remember the first step of each of these tests and think of it conceptually this way, then you pretty much have the rest of it figured out because both tests involve adding anti-human globulin reagent in order to induce an agglutination if the test is positive. All right, so let's run through this question now. We have a 27-year-old woman who has an episode of pneumococcal pneumonia that is treated with penicillin. Two days after therapy, she becomes jaundice and has anemia characterized by an increased reticulocyte count and an increased unconjugated bilirubin concentration. Which of the following tests would most likely explain her present findings? Before we look at the answer choices, let's consider what this question is trying to tell us. This lady had an episode of pneumonia that was treated with penicillin. Two days after, she starts developing these symptoms and lab findings. The lab findings indicate that there is some sort of hemolytic process taking place because the patient has an increased reticulocyte count, which means her body is trying to produce more red blood cells to make up for the loss, and an increased unconjugated bilirubin, which we know can occur through hemolysis because we have bilirubin inside RBCs. And then when you combine these lab findings with the history, which is recent treatment with an antibiotic, we begin to think, is this a drug-induced hemolytic reaction? If we're thinking drug-induced hemolytic reaction, then the best way to diagnose this test is, as we said, a direct Coombs test. And so your answer here is A. A serum ANA assay wouldn't really make sense here because that's used more for an autoimmune workup. A serum ferritin measurement will often be used to test for hemochromatosis. Serum LDH assay can be elevated in the case of a hemolytic reaction, but it's also nonspecific and doesn't really tell you what's going on. It just kind of further confirms that we're thinking of a hemolytic process here. And the urinary protoporphyrin measurement is going to be helpful if you're thinking of a heme metabolic disorder like acute intermittent porphyria. That one's a mouthful. So this one would not really be relevant to this question. All right, well, I hope you found this helpful. This topic can be a little bit confusing, which is why I wanted to go over it. If you have questions, leave them below. And as always, good luck, everybody.